I would like to welcome you to a talk um, that is sponsored by our center and co-sponsored by um, Berkeley's Center for Science, Technology, Medicine, and Society and the joint PhD um, in medical anthropology program between, I'm looking at it, UCSF <laughs> and UC Berkeley. Um, and I'm supposed to ask you to turn off all forms of electronic devices that produce obnoxious sounds unpredictably in the middle of talks. Um, now, it is with tremendous pleasure that I get to introduce Elizabeth Roberts, who is an associate professor of anthropology at the University of Michigan, and probably known to a few of you already. However, just in case, I'll tell you a couple of things about her. First of all, she happens to have a BA summa cum laude right here from Berkeley. <laughs> she then went on in a PhD program in medical anthropology, which frankly almost nobody gets to do because we always try to tell people to go elsewhere, which must give you some idea how much promise they also saw in this and maybe how convincing she also could be with respect to her mentors. Um, she is a feminist ethnographer of science, medicine, and technology. Her work has included research on rep uh, assisted reproduction in Ecuador and the United States, reproductive governance in Latin America, transnational medical migrations, and currently environmental health science in Mexico and the United States. She is the author of God's Laboratory Assisted Reproduction in the Andes. Also, it's kind of like a family affair published by our own University of California Press. The work challenges the foundational separation, the work of purification in Latour's vocabulary, for what that's worth, between medicine and religion by seeing how science and spirituality get linked through in vitro fertilization or IVF in Ecuador. Here she challenges fundamental assumptions about race, reproduction in the body and gender, rethinking the assumptions of individualism that shape ideology of biomedical practice as much, and in different ways, but as much in Latin America as in the United States. She challenges dominant narratives that see assisted reproduction as abnormal, as intrusions by people and technologies in the individual bodies, by suggesting that many Ecuadorians view the practices as part of a normally collective experience of human reproduction, in which families, God, and money always play a part. Her research was extension, extensive, involving almost of all of the IVF uh, clinics in Ecuador, and close work with, all right, great students, take notice here, a little bit of work here, doctors, other medical, biomedical professionals, patients, their families, biologists, sperm and egg donors, legal professionals, among others. The text gains depth and intimacy as she builds each chapter around a narrative of the experience of IVF for a particular patient and family. A major contribution to Latin American studies, as well as to feminist studies and medical anthropology, Professor Roberts looks at how IVF became part of long-standing ideologies and practices of whitening, and she developed here the lovely term, assisted whiteness. <laughs> she has published journal articles in the Journal of Royal, the Royal Anthropological Institute, the Journal of Latin American and Caribbean Anthropology, Anthropology and Medicine, Medical Anthropology, you know, all of them basically, including the highest barrier of them all, the American Ethnologist. I say this having just submitted one not too long ago, it took them six months to review it, and then the reviews, which were all favorable, we'd like to change you a few things, are longer than the article. <laughs> I haven't even succeeded in reading them all yet, and she published in the American Ethnologist, as well as clearly chapters in a range of co-edited uh, volumes. She co-edited with our own Berkeley Center for Social Medicine fellow in Whitmarsh, a special issue of medical anthropology, which is entitled, if my memory serves me, which it probably won't, towards a non-secular medical anthropology um, uh, that pushes, like Tasa, uh, Talal Assad's challenge for anthropology in general, to think beyond the sorts of sacred and secular binaries. Um, I know you want to hear her a lot more than um, you want to hear me, so I'm going to leave all the rest of it aside. I'm just going to say how pleased I am to have her with us today. Um, the title is in front of you. Um, I'm supposed to also tell you that she's supposed to talk for around 45 minutes, at which point we have plenty of time for discussions if I shut up right now, which I will, and ask you to join me in welcoming. That was 
such a wonderful introduction. Did you? Just, uh, no, I haven't seen that part about my book anywhere, so that was so nice. Thank you. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, and I wanted to uh, thank you to Charles and Seth for having me come. And this is a little bit, <laughs> this is really moving to be here because it does feel like I'm with family and um, I haven't been back to campus in a very long time. and. Also, I worked here in this very building as an undergraduate for the Survey Research Center about 25 years ago, and when I walked in, I realized that, and that's a, kind of an amazing thing to be back here after that. So thank you, and thank you for being here, because I cannot think of a better audience to think through this project with, so I'm hoping you have lots to ask me about and push me on um, in the question and answer period. And um, I debated a lot about what I was going to present because in some ways I just want to tell you about the overarching project I'm doing. And instead I'm just going to frame the talk with that project and then make kind of more of a proper talk with an argument. But I, I also just wish I could talk to you for long periods of time about this project itself. So, um, but I, I'm going to tell you a little bit about this project. So what I'm presenting today about toxicity and neighborhoods in Mexico City is from a much longer paper where I have more space to describe in greater detail the larger project in Mexico City that involves my ongoing collaboration, it's been five years now, with researchers from environmental, an environmental health project called Element. For 25 years, these researchers, most of them located at the University of Michigan, have studied the developmental effects of chemical exposures over the life course through a birth cohort study with around a thousand matched mother-child pairs recruited from throughout Mexico City. So my ethnographic work focuses on both A, the production of scientific knowledge about chemical exposures and their effects, and B, the daily lives of study participant families located in two distinct working class neighborhoods. The larger, so, this is just telling you a little bit more about the kinds of substances they collected in the last 25 years. And these are urine samples. Um, and so, and I guess one other thing, since many of you here probably are familiar with Mexico and healthcare in Mexico, all of the women were recruited when they were pregnant through the Seguro Social clinics in Mexico City. So they were all working class women that they or their partners had access to formal sector employment at the time that they were pregnant. So the larger aim of my collaboration with these environmental health scientists is the development of what I am calling a bioethnographic research platform, which combines this ethnographic data that I'm gathering both from the scientists and from the people that they study with biological data collected from these families over these last two and a half decades. And I'm doing this in order to ask questions about the relationship of environment to health that would not be possible through only ethnographic or biological data alone. And um, these are just images from um, the project. Does this have one of those little, I'm scared to touch it. Anyways, the one thing I do want to tell you about is this is my lab that I have right now with 10 undergraduates at the University of Michigan who are actually all just incredibly extraordinary. And these days I'm very interested in undergraduate labor because what they're doing for me in this lab is um, with my postdoc, Camilo Sanz, who um, got his PhD from the Antwerp program at UC Davis, we are training them and then teaching them how to do qualitative coding of all of the materials I collected in Mexico City. So it's um, interview transcripts, voice recordings, my field notes, my assistant field notes, and um, about 30,000 photos. And we're training them to do that, and they're developing projects um, on their own. I have a student just finishing her the first thesis that came out of it actually tomorrow, and she's done really wonderful things with it. And then we're trying to make that into a platform that can be more put, more easily put in conversation with all of this biological data that's been gathered. And um, maybe we can talk more about that in the Q&A. Blood samples, this is um, myself with um, Yes, while she's cooking. And this is a patient or a participant visit because the participants come back depending on funding year after year to be tested for new kinds of um, health effects related to chemical exposures over their life course. And then this I'll be talking a lot more about in a minute. 
Um, so three of the current bioethnographic projects that we've kind of carved out of the much larger project at this point, Camilo and I, my Josep and I, were working on a bioethnography of sleep because there's all this sleep data, and he's going to probably do some more intensive ethnographic work on sleep. <coughs> Um, my undergraduate with a postdoc in nutritional health sciences doing this bioethnography of eating. And then the thing that I'm spending most of my time doing these days is trying to get funding to go forward with taking all of this element data over 25 years and, um, and now thinking about it in terms of the neighborhood because they've only ever examined the data in terms of bodies that can be universalized and um, their individual bodies, and the main thing that came out of my time there was the difference between neighborhoods and how that can shape people's bodies. So, and pretty much that's what I'll be talking about today. So the bulk of my time these days is spent trying to make these projects happen. I have a lab where my postdoc and I, um, and these undergraduates, workshop or get, bring together this data. A big part of making these projects happen involves watching life scientists disentangle variables to make numbers. Whereas what Camilo and I do is entangle objects and methods to make complexity. But I'm increasingly less sure about the tenability of positioning our project under the banner of entanglement. So what I'm gonna do today is um, talk about what gets inside land and neighborhoods in Mexico City. And then I'm gonna talk about, and I'm gonna do that through a specific neighborhood. I'm gonna talk about what gets inside bodies in this particular neighborhood. And then I'm gonna think a bit about entanglement, but actually I'll think a little bit of about entanglement at the beginning as well. <coughs> in Colonia Periferico, a Mexico City working class land invasion neighborhood of bad reputation, mala fama, my landlady, Senora Natividad, always jokes about the smell. Once she visited her son for a few weeks outside of Portland, Oregon. It was beautiful and very green and the houses were very big. But she wanted to be back in Colonia Periferico in Portland, Signora Nati was alone in the house and the streets were empty. An alienating experience for Nati, accustomed to the social density of her neighborhood where everyone knows each other. This isolation was not for her. And then always the punchline, I needed to be back here where the air is sweet. Or sometimes she tells me, I needed to be back here where we get the stink for free. <laughs> we laugh loudly either way because in Colonia Periferico, the air is shit. Signora Nati's narrow, sturdy, four-story house painted a rich aquamarine, so right here, um, sandwiched between similarly vertical houses, is perched on top of a ravine, holding a narrow river of dam runoff filled with aguas negras and garbage, so sewage, basically. Birds, rats, and dogs frolic, frolic in the bush, entangled with garbage <coughs> on the riverbank below. In most rainy seasons, the dam overflows and the ravine fills, flooding these houses with torrential brown waters roiled with debris. I learned from local water ecologists that this flooding fills walls of cement houses like Signora Nati's with Salmonella, E. coli, and fecal enterococcus. Some in Colonia Periferico blame the dam for the respiratory diseases that plague the residents, although it's hard to say if there's a higher incidence in Periferico than elsewhere in this chronically polluted city. The stench is distinctive, though. Every time I return to Periferico, even after only a few days away, I have to brace myself all over again for a nasal assault. In a few hours, I get used to it, though, and can even sleep. Nati missed it when she was away, though. The smell does double duty for her and for her neighbors in making this distinct place. Besides providing an aromatic signature, the dam, along with other noxious phenomena, like the ring of cement factories surrounding Periferico that fills its boundary ears with dust, provides protection. The dam and cement factories are part of Periferico's defenses, managing what gets inside by preventing the incursion of both the police and public health surveillance, as well as the forces of gentrification. And this is an image of the dam, or I have lots of images of the dam. Um, in this paper, I'm interested in how Signora Nati laughs about some things that get inside her neighborhood and body, like smell, but not others, like police. Entanglement, a key concept in medical anthropology and science technology studies, could be easily put to work for understanding what gets inside. By tracing all the contingent and uncertain entangled relations that endow objects with seemingly stable and linear boundaries, 
Entanglement assumes relational being, permitting us to see how boundaries restrict our ability to know the world better. However, despite my own continued participation in the logic of entanglement, life conditions in Periferico, where breathing shit makes sense, make me increasingly uneasy about the rather unexamined deployment and celebration of entanglement and the embrace of its close relations, uncertainty, and staying with the trouble. So these images, this is an image I use all the time when I'm um, writing about exposure and different models of exposure. So you have these like separate bounded bodies and separate bounded things that can go inside bodies. And I don't like this picture, but I can't find anything better to kind of express entanglement. So if anyone has a better picture, <laughs> let me know. In this paper, where's the little thingy? No, not there, Thank you for that. Let's start with what entanglement rejects. Historians and philosophers of science provide us with a history of how boundaried facts came to be made through a world divided between subjects and objects so that particulate, autonomous, rational individuals, numbers, genes, calories, neurons, and bacteria came into being as apolitical entities that stand on their own to be seen by anyone through what Lorraine Dastin calls mechanical objectivity. To misquote Anne-Marie Moll, these objects can be without being related. This is the logic of industrial modernism, an autonomous mode of existence that divorced objects from their surroundings, helping produce this mess we're in, where, for instance, chemicals or antibiotics do not affect the world beyond their designated purpose. Within many of the social sciences, and I would argue also the life sciences as well, there has been in the last decades or so a move towards entanglement, we're now quoting Anne-Marie Mall correctly, to be is to be related. You think there's such thing as a gene that we can isolate? Think again. A gene is a relationship, and that relationship is political. You think a fact, a number, or a piece of evidence can stand alone, can be a thing in itself? Think again. All of those entities that looked boundaried under those misguided modernist classes are embedded in a myriad set of relations and, in fact, don't exist without them. This must be the better way to live in mutuality with each other and with this planet, where we trace out and acknowledge all the messy and entangled relations that produce existence. But the fact that certain groups of people have always been and continue to remain entangled in shit make me wonder about entanglement. What does an entangled prescription for being in the world do for or with those who have always had to stay with the trouble? My argument today about entanglement is guided by scholars who provide us with histories of both boundaries and entanglement by noting the differential distribution of porosity, what gets inside, across different life worlds, in parsing the chemical kinships of the pesticide-saturated island of Martinique, Vanessa Agar-Jones describes how some bodies are disproportionately porous, prompting, prompting us to think more about the nonlinear effects of toxic chemicals on the poor and the colonized. With a similar focus on the chemical histories of the Atlantic slave trade, Tiffany Lethabo King writes of 18th century indigo plantations in the American South, where the site of indigo processing was rank and putrid, was a rank and putrid smelling zone infested with flies. It was a place in the plantation where it was hard to breathe and a zone many avoided, which meant that the enslaved toiling there were not always within the master's immediate field of vision. While the chemicals that seeped into the pores of the enslaved contributed to their early deaths, usually five to seven years after starting to work the indigo, King argues that this toxicity provided new geographies of black freedom. Putrid toxicity disrupted the master's gaze. So in this paper, I investigate the implications of how allowing and even welcoming entanglement with noxious permeability provides boundaries that prevent other penetrations police violence, and health surveillance. And this allows persistence. But I'm not advocating breathing shit. Instead of celebrating the entangled resilience of those who can live within it, I want a different world. Signora Nati, though, is concerned with persisting in the reality she inhabits with the tools she has. And two of the tools I'm going to focus on today are, one, a willingness to be <coughs> entangled with toxins that serve as territorial boundaries, and two, maintaining the bodily and social density that these boundaries protect through shared substances. As we shall see, persistence might exist despite the porosity and penetration of boundaries and also because of them. So I need to make two points that with a lot more time I could spell out <laughs> at my leisure, but I'm not going to do that to 
in the interest of time. One is, is that um, probably the thing shaping life in Mexico City most today is the fact of this thing that I think it's useful to think of as one thing, which is NAFTA and the war on drugs. And that um, is helpful, I think, because together, not separately, they have incurred rural land dispossession on a massive scale, increased both internal and external migration, intensified militarization, especially of the police, even in Mexico City, furthered the privatization of public services, and increased Mexican body mass, created fatness, all to the benefit of transnational corporations. So in some ways, I, like in the paper, I'm, I just say NAFTA, the war on drugs, as a way to kind of get at the conditions that have been produced um, in the last 20 years in Mexico City. And then another thing to understand about Mexico City is there's a story about it that's not untrue, but it's complicated, that Mexico City is a safe zone in Mexico right now. And there's many, many ways that, that I would say that is very much true, especially in relation to a state like Guerrero. But um, it's also quite a dangerous place, um, especially in relationship to the militarization of the police. Okay. So in the context of Mexico City, Mexico's l larger Mexico struggles over territory, Colonia Periférico is holding somewhat steady for now. Colonia Periférico has multiple boundaries that allow for persistence. Entering Periférico by vehicle involves passing under a freeway interchange near a Costco, over a congested boulevard where new luxury condos rise, through an odiferous recycling and garbage processing zone, then junk food distribution centers, and dusty cement factories established near the now defunct sand mines that made the cement that built mid-century Mexico City. Walking in through this passageway leaves you covered in a fine residue of cement dust. The smell hits at the entrance to Periferico at a river overpass downhill from Senora Nati's house. Three civic buildings converge at this spot one of Periférico's two elementary schools, a corrugated metal community center and playground exercise zone, and a security module manned 24 hours a day by three rotating policemen with varying attitudes towards Periférico and its residents. For all practical purposes, this is the only entrance for vehicles, although there are many more by foot. This single entrance opens to Periférico's main artery, Calle Benito Juárez, a street that rises up a hill that covers the sand mines beneath, and um, sometimes houses collapse into the sand mines, and that kind of adds to this feeling of instability in many ways. All day and early evening, Benito Juárez is clogged with cars, combis, and delivery trucks, often completely at an impasse. Instead of heading up Benito Juarez, you could enter one of the several narrow callejones or alleys or drive or walk alongside a long embankment wall topped by a cyclone fence that serves as another border. More junk food factories lie on the other side. The embankment is littered with garbage and cans of Activo, which is pipe loose solvent that when inhaled provide hallucinations on the cheap and serves as a stage for graffiti contests and rap groups protesting police violence. The dam is upriver from the security module. Topped by a causeway, the dam is one of the most used walking entrances as it leads to an adjoining colonia. This causeway, possibly the most powerful stink point in all of Periférico, was landscaped not too long ago with plants and exercise machines that are supposed to get Mexico moving. <laughs> in the dry season, delegacion officials perform their annual act of sending crews and heavy machinery to dredge the dam of the garbage that plugs the grates where the water sluices through. This act is repeated the year after and the year after that. Periférico is the last residential stop for a system of dams that controls this particular river before the Aguas Negras head underground. Thus the stench of the filth has maximally accumulated as it moves down from on high. Periférico's boundaries are also marked by death. Santa Muerte, Holy Death, Saint Death, guards the dam entrance and also the border between Periférico and El Caricol, a less established colonia near the security module entrance. Santa Muerte is an unusual saint in that she was never a person whose virtuous life can be emulated. And when you talk to priests about her, that's, that's the main mark against her. You can't emulate her virtuous life. Um, patron of the marginalized, the incarcerated, the queer, the poor, La Flaquita, La Niña Blanca, is the great equalizer since everyone dies. She is not respectable. These junctures of dam, smell, and death bring encounters with the police, at least for me. 
Several times police stopped me at Periferico's pedestrian borders telling me I could not enter the neighborhood. Too dangerous for a gringa. These were the only occasions I ever felt menaced in Mexico City. One afternoon while I showed a photographer from the US the dam, four policemen tried to stop us from recovering from recrossing the causeway back into Periferico. We did anyways. The minute we passed off the causeway back inside, the police stopped as if held back by an invisible wall. They turned and walked away as a group of young men, including these two young men, they're sitting in the same spot they were, smoking weed and drinking beer safely inside Periferico's boundaries hurled insults towards their back. At that moment, they and Periferico were impermeable to the police, and so were we. This is what Menendez, the most seasoned and calm of the three policemen stationed at the module, had told me, but he and other policemen won't enter Periferico. They won't go farther than 50 meters past their post because then they too would be vulnerable. If they tried to chase someone, La Rata, the, um, <laughs> the miscreant, would disappear in the maze of callejones and through the doors of houses opened by the misguided re residents who harbor miscreants. Menendez is sanguine about his inability to enter Periferico. The other two policemen, though, both younger and hot-headed, convey more disdain for the colonia that they cannot enter, decrying Periferico's boundaries that protect, according to them, dysfunction, violence, drug abuse, incest, and teen pregnancy. The magical invisible wall did not always hold, though. In the spring of 2015, the police entered Periferico all the way up to the top of Benito Juarez and shot and killed a young man that was trying to flee on foot. Nearby, Alma, one of the women whose family I was working with, and her two young daughters, Danny and Mar, heard the shots and hid in their bedroom in the back of their house. Two days later, police carried out a raid on the home of Periferico's main drug dealing family, the Gomezes, safely tucked away in the cul-de-sac three blocks up from Alma's house. A few days after that, teenage boys began standing in front of Alma's house selling drugs. Alma wasn't angry. She knew the boys. It's their mothers who sell her used toys and clothes for the girls. But she didn't want Danny and Mar to play on the street while the drugs were exchanged in broad daylight. The drug dealing boys left in mid-December of 2015. The police are gone as well, at least for now, and by most recent accounts haven't been back. Colonia Periferico's malif mala fama extends to working class people who live outside, especially taxi drivers, who know it by more than just reputation. Menendez reassured me that I was not the only person that taxi drivers deposited at night at the security module, refusing to pass inside, making me walk the rest of the way home. I took to doing informal interviews with taxi drivers about Periferico. Drivers repeated a litany of reasons for not entering what they saw as a crime-infested neighborhood. They'd been robbed in Periferico, people didn't pay their fares, young men surrounded them when they were stuck in a bottleneck and would reach in and steal things. They would take anything they could. Who could blame them for not wanting to go inside? Um, in the longer paper, I have example after example of the ways that people were cons outside of um, Periferico were telling me about the danger of Periferico, including um, young men that helped me move some furniture in, telling me that, oh, okay, we don't want to enter, but now that you live there, you can tell people you live there and they won't mess with you because they know your boyfriend will come kill them. Or um, things like um, a f my neighbor across the street telling me that when her boyfriend who lived outside the neighborhood came to um, kind of harass her and her baby and her mom, and he had beaten her when she lived with him and his family, all of the boys in the neighborhood got together and beat him up and sent him away. And then um, young men that I would interview would say that when they were in prison, they, besides Tepito, Periferico was the one neighborhood that garnered respect. And Tepito, if you are familiar with Mexico City, is the most kind of infamous neighborhood in Mexico City. So I tell you all of this to contrast um, how, soon after what I was ensconced in Signora Nati's home, I realized I had never felt so safe in my life. Inside Periferico, children play on the streets and everyone knows each other. There is absolutely no commercial reason to enter Periferico from the outside. There are no chain stores, not even the ubiquitous Oxos or 7-Elevens that permeate all of Mexico City because of franchise owners' fears of theft. That means all of Periferico's abarrotes, the little stores, are family owned. While there are no chain or convenience stores, that doesn't mean that everything isn't for sale. Everyone I know, even kids, sell things from their homes to neighbors and family, whether it's hand embroidery, food, unlocking cell phones, glasses, classes, or catalog sales of lingerie, makeup, and shoes. 
selling adds to the density of interaction that I'm now going to tell you a lot about. There is no reason to enter Periferico then unless you live there or know someone. For that reason, getting on the pe- combi to enter Periferico at the nearby metro station feels like entering the neighborhood itself. You need to say hello and goodbye to everybody. People from Periferico who now live elsewhere tell me all the time how they miss this knowingness. Frequent novenas, processions, masses, velorios, quinceaños, first communions, and children's birthday parties take place in the middle of the street, with everyone moving to the side when cars need to pass. Those passing by often join in. The parties spill over into each other. At most of these parties, I receive lessons on being, or in my case, becoming naka. So nako is the main word, naka, if you're female. Especially through vocabulary and tone of voice. While usually an insult, denoting its recipient as vulgar, unrestrained, tacky, and low class, in Periferico, being naco was a badge of honor. Naco pride and Periferico pride went hand in hand, an embrace of the located excess wrapped up in naco's nawat root that is said to mean of this place. With loud laughter, almost to the point of a cackle, heavy makeup, big hair and big tattoos, household display niches filled with multiple saints, often exact replicas of each other, packaged baby formula and garish soda bottles, heavy belly spilling out of heavy clothes, loud music and intensive sociality, Periferico is lived through an unrestrained, exuberant density of excess. This mode of living is not based on a model of pristine and minimalist nature that informed the lives of middle class and elite Mexicans seeking to live as boundary non-excessive individuals in their well-resourced lives. Periferico's density made for close quarters and naco disinterest in drawing boundaries between the natural and the artificial allowed for many forms of chemical kinship. People's livelihoods colonized the cramped streets mostly without complaint. Cars and pedestrians have to maneuver around temporary stalls selling fruit, underwear, costumes, saints, and pirated DVDs. Some of these livelihoods are noxious, from car painting that take over the sidewalks with fumes and spray emanating outward. There was one tortilleria that I couldn't go to, although everyone else was fine because it was right next to um, car spray or spray paint all the time, to the clouds of dust pouring out of wood and wor- workshops, to the acrid stench of the metal shop on the hill above the dam. These street businesses are noisy, although they cannot drown out the cacophony of speakers blasting from roofs or the chained dogs bark- barking. In all of this, it's striking how little the smell of the dam figures into everyday conversation. The smell is just one more thing, like noise and spray emanating from inside Colonia Periferico that gets inside its residents' bodies. Nearly everyone tells me that Periferico is safer than it was before when they were young. There's multiple theories about why. Some say there were inside delinquents and these young men are now dead or in prison or grew up. This could be true. Time and geography seem to be part of this story as well. The density of knowingness has had more time to grow since the initial land invasion, and so have the ramparts, the cement plants, the freeway, the junk food factories. Another way the defensive has grown is through the smell, through the aguas negras. The dam used to be a soccer field half the year, and during the rainy season, the river ran so clean you could swim in it. It drew people from the surrounding colonias. Now the dam is a boundary that permits passage, but who would cross the shit isthmus except for those who live inside? The specific area of Colonia Periférico's founding made these ramparts possible. Periférico is a land invasion neighborhood, meaning it was settled by colonists, mostly from rural Mexico, who squatted land in the early 60s through the early 70s. Many of Mexico City's current upscale neighborhoods used to be land invasion settlements, where the squatters were evicted through the privatization of ejido lands, meaning um, land made available through agrarian reform. So they became available for high-end real estate development. This hasn't happened in Periferico, though, where what was built there has made for an impressive stability that has endured. Signora Nati's household is similar to the majority of households I got to know in Periferico, holding up to four generations with title to their homes, often in an older woman's name. No one who lives with their natal family pays rent. This means that Periferico's residents do not have to contend with the evictions so common to working class poor and increasingly middle class people in nations, regions, and cities with skyrocketing real estate markets. Periferico's residents tell me of shopping mall developers sniffing around a few years ago, but then losing interest because of the smell and the reputation. 
After living in Periferico for six months, I lived for six months in Buena Vista, a working class neighborhood working, and there again, I worked with three families also participating in the environmental health study and then got to know everything I could about the neighborhood and other families as well. Situated in the foothills of the mountains that ring Mexico City to the south, Buena Vista feels bucolic and almost village-like. My small house sat within a family's larger compound that also housed horses, sheep, chicken, and dogs. Buena Vista was not a land invasion neighborhood. Lots were laid out in, precise, in a precise grid and sold to buyers in the 70s and 80s, which means its wide streets have right angles, unlike the winding, confusing alleys of Periferico. As in Periferico, the three families I worked with had title to their land and homes, but all around them, household compounds were in the process of being bulldozed for new condos. The beginnings and ends of Buena Vista are not obvious, running into colonias that all feel the same. Unlike Periferico, Buena Vista is located on major transportation routes and has commerce and flow. T unlike in Periferico, taxi drivers drive me home all the way at night. With its right angles, fresh air, and wide vistas of forested mountains, walking in Buena Vista doesn't feel like walking through intestines. <laughs> this sense of peace was not quite as it seemed, though. Police permeated the colonia, and petty and major crime was rampant. Police shakedowns were common for store owners, and they still are. There were signs hung on households warning ratas, delinquents, of zero tolerance every few blocks. I don't like to walk there alone at night. With its flow in size, Buena Vista's openness makes it harder to know or be known. At the night, the streets are empty. Despite its good reputation, Buena Vista did not feel safe for its residents, its permeability allowing for instability. Especially after my time in Buena Vista, it became clear how Periférico's mala fama provided security in both land and social relations. Living in Periférico was the inverse of every middle-class coastal or college town neighborhood in the United States that I've ever known, where even before the hyper-focus on BPA-free baby bottles and organic food, there was the assumption built in of the ability and right to protect one's insides. This protection incurs invisibly, though. Um, through the advantage of a century of zoning laws that favored the middle class. Instead, Periferico, I would say, is more like the gated communities that academics like us so disdain. Just like the wealthy who live inside these walled zones, the residents of Periferico work to protect their insides from outsides, where NAFTA and the drug war rages on. Instead of gates and private security guards, though, Periferico's stability is predicated on its mala fama, its toxicity, a protective porosity that allows for its persistence. So now we're going to move to the body part. That was land. As with the police, Periferico can be stubbornly impenetrable to the territorial and educational incursions of public health surveillance, especially those interventions that target people as individuals in regards to their health and the health of their children. While keeping public health surveillance out, Periferico lets corporately processed foods inside the bodies of its residents, just like spray paint and the stink of the dam. Processed substances like soda increase stability through social pleasure amidst the daily injuries exacerbated through the effects of NAFTA and the war on drugs. One of, Peri um, one of NAFTA and the drug war's clear successes in Mexico was making processed and sugary foods and beverages cheaper and more available. And I have so... I, Middle class friends in Mexico City kind of have this similar story about growing up, people around my age, but how you could never get access to American candy bars and the kind of sugar that's available now. And one thing that I think often we forget about Mexico, it was that it was an incredibly protectionist state until NAFTA came along. So the food landscape now is sugar saturated. By 2013, Mexico was designated the world's fattest industrial nation, um, supplanting us. We're number two. This designation, through Mexico's individualizing public health anti-obesity efforts into overdrive, with a special focus on soda, identified as one of the key drivers of the obesity epidemic. And Mexico, indeed, is the largest consumer of Coca-Cola products in the world um, by landslide. It's, it's real, they're also the largest consumer of bottled water in the world, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So um, there's a lot to say about public health efforts. Um, within the NAFTA era, the NAFTA era. Um, and I've been in a lot of conversations with public health folks in Mexico 
who are part of the people who are the architects of this, these kinds of campaigns to tell people to, to give their children less soda. And there's a lot of interesting things to say about that, and including their own knowledge that they really have no ability to do anything structural, given the way these trade negotiations work. Um, but they'll also say things like these sorts of ads, which are all over Mexico City, they're huge billboards, are not really geared towards regular people, they're geared geared towards um, lawmakers in their efforts to do things like get soda taxes passed. So there's, you know, they're, they're smart people, but they're um, in this situation that's pretty untenable and trying to figure out what to do in terms of this thing that they're convinced is a huge problem, which is obesity. So while billboards like these um, do not appear to get working class people to drink less soda, they do work to create more class distinction. One of the most palpable differences between upscale and working class and poor neighborhoods in Mexico City, as in much of the urban world, is body size. Upscale neighborhoods are thin, everywhere else is fat. Colonia Periferico is no exception. Most people in Periferico over 15 are heavy, and so are many of the kids. Periferico is a heavy place. These billboards say, give your children water, but water is simply not reliable. Because Periferico is located more centrally, it has water almost all the time, but there's a lot of working class neighborhoods in Mexico City that just doesn't have water all the time. But drinking water, um, they have it all the time, but drinking water trucks selling bottled water, which is what people say they need to drink, um, don't always get in. Other deliveries do get in though. Coca-Cola, Sabritas, which is potato chips, Bimbo trucks, Club Benito, Calle Benito Juarez, um, the major artery of the neighborhood, backing up traffic at the entrance. This power to get inside is unknown to the police force guarding Periferico's entry. It's also a power unknown to social and healthcare workers. The director of a Seguro Popular healthcare clinic that serves Periferico, along with other low-income colonias nearby, was stunned when she heard that I lived inside. She explained she could not get complete health surveys in Periferico because her workers were too afraid to enter. In the landscape of the Delgaciones social, social services, Periferico is a punto rojo, it's a hot spot. In meetings, interviews, and conversations with social workers, those charged with making Periferico less marginalized, they would rattle off its endless problems. It's too dense, rampant teen pregnancy, children don't attend social programs. It was narrated as, as an abject and dangerous cesspool of violence, drugs, and broken families. These characterizations didn't square with my experiences of Periferico as safe and stable. So when the horrors of Periferico were narrated, it came to seem as if the colonia was designated a Punto Rojo precisely because of its successful resistance to pastoral administrations, a form of functionality that was difficult for these state actors to imagine. One thing that social workers and police get right, though, is that drugs are done inside Periferico, and those who do them, mostly young men, do them in public. What would be difficult for them to know is that in many ways, public drug taking contributes to Periferico's stability. Two drugs dominate the streetscapes. I can never say this in English anymore. Marijuana, Mar instead of marijuana, and activo. Marijuana is a social drug among, that people do among and with others. And there's a lot to say about it, but I assume you all know a little bit more about my marijuana than Optivo, a pipe loose solvent um, easily purchased at hardware stores, which provides hallucinations on the cheap, as I said before. It's not social in the same way that um, pot is. The young men who inhale it usually do it alone or sometimes alone together on pilgrimages, on religious pilgrimages. They stare into space, sometimes shadow boxing the air while muttering. Yellow and red Activo cans litter the callejones and the walls bounding Periferico. Activo users are usually very thin. As my eyes became accustomed to the heavy knuckle bodies of Periferico, I began to wonder about any thin man. Does he use? Does he have no women to feed him? Does he not share in the pleasures of being enmeshed with others? Signora Nati, like most of the grandmothers and great-grandmothers that I know in Periferico, is both moralistic and philosophical about drug use. She attributes drug use to the social failure of families. She doesn't talk about structural economic decline. But she does not blame the user either. Her godson living across the street uses Activo. She speaks fondly about this thin, this rail thin young man with a permanently glassy stare. She tells me how when he isn't inhaling, he's sweet to her and she feeds him. Another Activo user, Osvaldo, is always stationed on the street near the bakery. 
People give him food and sometimes odd jobs. He is treated similarly to Eva and her brother Rodrigo, two mentally disabled siblings who are constantly put to work throughout Periferico, hauling garbage and sweeping. Acceptable public drug use is a striking non-acceptance of the terms of the war on drugs, which in the name of health forces drug use underground. It was the very public nature of their drug taking that allowed Activo users' safety enmeshed in the care of the colonia that integrates drug users and the disabled into everyday life. Soda, though, permeates the bodies of more residents than illegal drugs. Its post-NAFTA drug war dissemination is wider and more profitable. As with illegal drugs, there are public health efforts to prevent its penetration. When asked directly about soda, most working class people I know link it to ill health, maybe fatness, maybe diabetes, but all maybe in the future. Sometimes they link it to nerves, that's the bigger issue. They all point out that it costs almost no more than water, it tastes better, the pleasure is shareable. It's rude not to offer it to others. Who would share water? Some men tell me laughing that they once tried to stop because they heard it might cause problems later on, but they only lasted a few days. Laughing even harder, they declare, it's more addictive than what the narcos sell. Besides the TV and the billboards blanketing the cityscapes, parents in Mexico City <coughs> know that soda should be the enemy because of recent rules that prohibit children from bringing soda to school. Only water, agua simple, is allowed. In 2014, Alma and Mar, the same woman that heard the shots that I was telling you about earlier on, they showed me how they both break the rules, both giggling mightily. Mar, who was five at the time, wouldn't drink agua simple. She wanted more. She wanted the corporeal joy that flavor and sugar provide. Lovingly, Alma wanted Mar to have more. She, brought clear, she bought a clear soda and poured it into clear plastic water bottles to, feel, to fool Mar's teachers. A year later, I asked Alma if she was still sending clandestine soda in Mar's lunch to school, and she laughed even harder than before and told me the teacher caught her and all the other mothers doing the same, <laughs> and now smells and tastes the water that comes to school with the children. So you must understand how giving soda to kids is just one form of loving care here in Periferico. Alma's care for her children is endless. She diligently signs them up for city enrichment programs. She carefully keeps track of, of all their doctor's visits through Mexico's comprehensive e oops, healthcare system. She has their medical passports always at the ready. That's her notes there. Neatly filled out, documenting their every ailment. Danny and Mars' near constant supply of antibiotics and asthma medications are precisely arranged on the table in the middle of the living room at all times. She knows the long generic names of all the medications the girls take. Alma cooks with lots of fruits and vegetables and only cooks with bottled water. And Alma, who is, a diligent, who is diligent about the health and safety of her children, shows her love not through restraining her children's caloric intake, but by giving them more whenever she can. Alma seeks to stabilize Danny and Mar as they learn how to inhabit the unstable environment outside of Periferico, which seems invested in their existence only insofar as they can be chastised for their fatness or as consumers of more soda. Being more permeable to soda and less permeable to anti-obesity messages makes sense in Periferico, but this doesn't register with public health efforts that call for resistance to soda. These efforts resonate with other public health campaigns worldwide that exhort people as individuals to remove themselves from forms of sociality that are necessary for their survival. For instance, public health campaigns that tell IV drug users not to share needles do little when for homeless IV drug users, the people you share needles with are the people who have your back. And I'm obviously citing Philippe's work. Barebackers, men who glory in unprotected anal sex with other men in the face of par harsh public health condemnation, experience welcome obliterating, communi obliterating communitas after decades of exhaustion from living in an epidemic. And in Brazilian shanty towns, feeding infant formula instead of breast milk distributes responsibility towards male partners who pay for their child's sustenance. In, and that's obviously Nancy's work and Tim Dean's above that. In such instances, when chemical kinship flows through infant formula, heroin, semen, or soda, survival depends on permeation of socially shared substances and substantive sociality. While public health poses these substances as threats to individual lives, it's crucial to see how they provide protective porosity. 
that sustains life at collective levels, like the shit, the cement dust, graffiti, and twisting callejones contributing to Periferico's protective porosity at the territorial scale, so did distributed between the bodies of family and neighbors can serve simultaneously as both hazard and protection. So this is the conclusion. As scholars committed to entanglement and uncertainty, we critique the linear thinking involved in the public health exhortations to stop sharing the substances that ensure survival. And in the longer paper, I'm juxtaposing this with all of the work that's um, emerging around resilience and critiquing resilience, but also thinking a lot about how resilience embeds some things that we might possibly want to preserve. But maybe we can talk about that in the Q&A. Linear thinking, we know, shuts down the possibility of tracing how substances and chemicals might be engaged in looping relations with bodies situated in their specific worlds, or that bodies with histories might be part of a feedback relationship with chemicals. Linear tendencies tend to universalize bodies while simultaneously individualizing behavior, for instance, in anti-obesity campaigns that don't take a radically transformed food landscape and mul the multiple destabilizations of the drug war into account. By contrast, the nonlinear thinking of entanglement allows us to ask if people breathe shit to protect themselves from the police, might they be more or less affected by soda or by lead, which is one of the main substances that the project I'm working with looks at. Or ask how might the vast transformation in the post-NAFTA drug, um, drug war food landscape linked to the increase in body mass shape the uptake of bisphenol A and phthalates, which are other chemicals that this project I work with um, looks at. However, as we shift our efforts to loop and entangle phenomenon amongst the uncertainty, we need to notice the effects of leaving linearity behind. Boundaries and linear models might be necessary responses in places where life is relentlessly entangled and objects like water are never stable, stabilized with or from their relations. For many of the world's inhabitants, the entanglement of everything with everything is relentlessly exhausting. I'm pretty sure, for instance, that residents of Colonia Periferico would like to share in the privilege of inhabiting a world where objects can be experienced as boundary from the relations that make them. A world, for instance, with reliable drinking water, formal sector employment, and a civil police force. Our first bioethnographic correlation, um, which took over five months to make, and is a huge story in itself, shows that the average blood lead levels of children in Periferico are nearly a full microgram per deciliter higher than in Buena Vista or in the element cohorts overall. And I'm learning that that amount is highly statistically significant. Thus, in Periferico, protective porosity involves toxic entanglement. With the goal of knowing the world better then, STS might complicate celebratory calls for the uncertainty of entanglement that stays with the trouble by taking into account both the practices that make boundaries and what those very boundaries have to offer. By tracking where both boundaries are drawn and where permeability is emphasized in order to make stability, we can avoid celebrations of breathing shit without dismissing the densely social life worlds that produce stability through its inhalation. Signora Nati seeks persistence through the management of what gets inside neighborhoods and bodies. Persistence entails her neighborhood, where bodily permeability to toxicity prevents territorial penetration. Soda gets inside, spray paint gets inside, bacteria get inside, a fecal transplant that in a funhouse mirror image of the Cold War immune system prevents the penetration of foreign invaders. Porosity to drugs, soda, and shit stabilizes the borders of Periferico in the time of NAFTA and the war on drugs. The stink is the price paid, the stink of a life lived in a dense, gut-shaped labyrinth that you miss while staying at your son's empty house in the green and lonely grid of Portland. Well, if your audience is not too entangled with your <laughs> words and images to ask questions... Please, please, please. <laughs> Thank you. That was really interesting. I, I come from Mexico, I'm from Chiapas. Oh, mm -hmm. and uh, obviously, obesity in Chiapas is a, it's, you know that's a national thing. But um, Chiapas is very, very rural, and um, 
and people are having, you know, the effects of drinking sugar drinks. But the thing is, these companies, they have uh, better systems of distribution that the government has. Yes. So you can, I mean, I worked against mining in Chiapas, and I would be in communities that would take me, you know, like this many hours in a car and then hiking, yep. and then you finally got to the place, and, and they have the store. <laughs> yeah, and they have Coca-Cola, and you're like, Coca-Cola can get here, but the government cannot, or the services cannot, and they don't have clean water, and you know, we have like this really uh, disruptive relationship with water in Mexico, and so it's, it's it's, I don't know, I, I recently went to the Black Panther uh, person, uh, thing at the museum here and Edgar Hoover was saying that the, their food program was like one of the most disruptive, dangerous things that the government could have because it was, it was basically like, uh, what was the word, uh, kind of like substituting government and, and in a way I feel like that's what's happened in Mexico with all these yeah. companies to like the detriment of people and the problem is we haven't internalized, you know, I think our colonial like mindsets, we haven't internalized a lot of the structural things that are part of the conversation in the States. And even I myself, who lived here before and now has been back in Mexico, haven't really, a lot of the things that I'm learning now that I'm in Berkeley, I just have never really thought about them in that way, you know, and what you were saying about them, considering mm -hmm. those, I don't know, it's just, it's really interesting to, see this take on, on how certain things protect you that are also kind of... And just to, to add to the complexity, yeah. um, so I was working with these urban water ecologists and I, I continue to work with them and one of the things that I learned, because people don't drink the tap water for the most part, although Senor Ignati does, but most people don't. And it turns out um, in Mexico City, and infrastructures are really different in different states in Mexico and within different cities. But in Mexico City, it turns out the tap water is actually almost completely safe to drink. Um, and people stopped drinking it after the 85 earthquake when there was a period where you really shouldn't drink the water. But um, bottled tap water distributors made sure that people never regain trust. So we did water testing in all the households uh, that I was working, all the families I worked with and all the households I was working in. And there was less bacteria in the tap water than in the commercially available water. And we're, we're one of the things that are going on with this neighborhood environment study that I'm trying to get off the ground is we're gonna learn a lot more about the infrastructure of specific neighborhoods. But one of the things that isn't known in Mexico, so people who are looking at this and also really concerned about the fact that actually just where the plastic water bottles go is an enormous issue now in Mexico. Um, they also just don't know that much about um, the pipes and metals in the pipes. Um, so there's this whole way that the water actually is safe to drink, but everyone thinks what you must do is buy water, and that is if you're going to drink water. But a lot of people just don't drink water. No. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just, do, just a, a very, first a very short one. Just on the condition of the experiment, the bioavailability of this population, so how have they become so permeable? Because you're so, I mean, that, that's a small one. As, you're, as you're, experimental as subjects. As experimental subjects, because it's, I mean, I'm part of thinking about, because you set up this extraordinary, amazing talk, and it's, 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 but it's, it's, but that's a surprise in some way, given everything else you set up. And, it's, and I'm thinking with that. The surprise is that it's an extraordinary talk. No. <laughs> <laughs> the surprise is that it's 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 that there is this pre-existing to your own entry, entry yeah. Yeah. permeability bioavailability of yes. people to these right. So it's the, the, the bigger question is is, is um, so I mean I'm thinking about a different approach to obesity in Berlin, for example, mm -hmm. where where the um, uh, there there's no question that that, for example, the slow death of, of uh, class obesity uh, provides necessary sucker in a, in a painful and hurtful world, but at the same time is a problem. But here there's more of, I'll, I'll use it in the best sense, more of a functionalist claim that on the contrary, it's not simply that it, it, it becomes psychically necessary, but, but it's killing you, and that's the violence, but that in fact this also produces the condition of stability of life of, of something else. And so it, it, we're almost left in some, and if we could afford not to only be literary about it, in some apparatic, undecidable condition where the, the political 
choices are suspended, otherwise you'd line up amongst all the other experts who are trying to permeate and penetrate. It's, it's, but, so I'm trying to think through, because there was so extraordinary, with what the claim is for linearity at the end, because mm -hmm. I still don't quite, I mean, it's, the demand you make on us is powerful, but I'm trying to think through what, what you want at that last moment. Yeah, thank <laughs> you. I, I'm not sure either. Okay, the first question is kind of easy, I think. Uh, I think it's a really interesting question because the, well, the answer is kind of interesting. So one of the conditions of doing science in a place like Mexico is that, or doing longitudinal birth cohort work, is that the conditions of um, production and the making are so different. So in the United States, when you go to enroll people in a study, the main people that are going to interact with your study participants are, I mean, I'm doing this completely by putting myself in this category. There are young women just out of college who are psychology majors who are going to go on to graduate school. And that is the way the funding structures work it, to do that kind of, or they're going to be, maybe if they're taking blood, um, you know, they, they're going to go to nursing school or something like that. And Mike Montoya talks about this in his work in, in Mexico. In Mexico, or at least this particular project, but I would say in Mexico, one of the things that's really interesting is that in some ways they have a much better public health care system than we do because so you can easily recruit people through EAMS. But the other thing is this project has been going for 25 years. Every single staff person there has been there for 25 years. And that is one of the things that makes it that all of these people, this little girl, knew those people, I mean, not to get weirdly pro before since before she was born. I mean, every, and one of the biggest ways that people feel like they are being cared for, even though I would argue Eames is a pretty good system, um, is that they get kinds of personalized attention, including, this is the big thing, being picked up in a private car and taken to these appointments and then given tons of referrals. That kind of connection means that their retention rates are incredibly high. And so my, when the women that are the ones that call people up and say, hey, it's time for another round, Kate called up on my behalf. I mean, they have all thousand mothers memorized. They know every single thing about those people. So when I say, oh, I'm going to see Edith today, they know exactly who I'm talking about. They know the issues she's had with her kids. They, they, they know it all. So, um, and the main thing that I weirdly often am telling these environmental health scientists is how the lack of attention overall, structurally, is the thing that's allowing them to do this study in such a comprehensive way with such high retention rates. And they keep doing all these weird management surveys about like why do people retain. And I, you know, it's complicated having these relationships with environmental health scientists. And they want me, my input on these surveys, and the thing that I'm not really pointing out to them is just the act of asking the question is the thing that is again binding the subjects to the study even more. So um, when they called up, I mean, we went to a, a few other families that ended up saying no because what I was doing was really intrusive. Like I was at their houses like eight to 12 hours a week for months and months and months and I go back constantly. Um, but it was just not hard to recruit. So that's the answer to that. And then, <laughs> I mean, I hope I get to talk to you more about what I'm trying to, get at the end. I'm not, I'm not sure. I mean, I'm, I'm increasingly uncomfortable with entanglement, and I'm hanging out with these people that are making numbers. I'm now responsible for helping make a number. This blood lead level, they never parsed by neighborhood. And this blood lead level shows up, something that kind of is predicted by what I was saying. And I don't want the numbers to be stronger than my ethnography, but I'm trying to think about ways that then what I know complicates that number, like, you know, there's a, I'm learning a lot about neighborhood um, effects literature. And all of the things that I'm saying are going on in Periferico are the things that in neighborhood effects literature are, are supposed to contribute to bad health and social incohesion or social disarray. And I'm kind of saying, actually, I think there's really, graffiti you could think about in really different ways than the way you're doing it. But, but I just, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know what I want to do with the linear, and I, but I think there's something about constantly celebrating this. And I mean, the person I'm not naming here, I really, Evan's book, I love him, but Emergent Ecologies is way too celebratory for my taste of what it means to live in these kinds of toxic environments. So I don't know. It's not like linearity is the answer. Yeah, <laughs> this was a great paper. It's a really, really wonderful project, and I can't wait to start reading what you 
I don't know, maybe you already have something published on that. No, and this is, this I just sent the longer version of this in long. the other day. Okay, and so, so I'm hopefully. Talk to you about um, entanglements. <coughs> about what? Entanglements. Entanglements, so, please. Um, I mean, it was kind of hard to follow, but what I came to setting up at the beginning was a really great description of why entanglement celebration is a problem. Mm -hmm. And I'm 100% behind you on mm -hmm. Evans, and even maybe Donna's. Yeah. I'm, but um, the second part of the talk really made it feel like you were trying to force these mm -hmm. very problematic situations of toxics getting into bodies through drugs and coke into a model that would su support this idea of boundaries being good. Mm -hmm. And I just don't know if that um, works. Um, because uh, for a couple of things that might, and I don't have a solution to how to make the boundary, I mean, you ended it by saying, look, we have to complicate the model, which I agree with. But you know, think of, on the one hand, the, the notion of public health as a good. It seems like a boundary is good in a condition of harm or assault. And um, a boundary is not good in a condition of something that's, that's salutary. So you know, there are efforts to think through public health in ways that use notions of entanglement. Um, Alex Nading's work on mm -hmm. entanglement in, in, in public health is really amazing in that it shows how the entanglements really are, are working to, to, and that you can't see the efforts as anything but entanglement. And the other way to maybe problematize your second half of the paper is to think about maybe the, the fact that science itself you kind of have to, you, you're trying to straw man science a little bit around this idea of the object formation and the, the linear thinking, when in fact a lot of the work in science studies is talking about entanglement because science is itself using models of entanglement. The world is entangled, and the models that are being used to understand toxicities um, in bodies are very much about entanglements and uh, capacity, carrying capacity, and, and they always started out that way, you know. Adverse effect levels are all about, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> the entanglement of not being able to set a, a decent limit in a condition where, you know, the good mm -hmm. is not clearly outweighed by the bad. So um, I would push you to think more about those problems um, and also the possibility of science itself. You, you're saying that you're pushing back on the science that's being used here, but actually their models might already be much more <coughs> uh, promisingly entangled mm -hmm. uh, and using models of the world that are more entangled. Yeah. So, yes, and <laughs> the more I hang out with people in environmental health located within public health schools, the more disappointed I am in actually the in their ability to do entangled thinking. And part of it is because many of them are located in the school of nutrition. And so, I mean, different science, you know, different histories of like exposure science is different than nutrition science and things like that. And I'm, I'm learning a lot about that. So, um, and then there's the people who are like the public health officials in Mexico that I'm talking to that are extraordinarily interesting and brilliant and also have their hands tied in all kinds of ways about what's possible. But in thinking about things like soda or nutrition, when they're working with participant populations, the, the linear variables they're working with are really, really strong. And I'm trying to think of an example. I mean, the fact that I'm saying, um, you know, soda might mean some other things than just a calorie is really pretty impossible to talk through among this particular group of people. The other thing is, is that I'm finding really interesting in terms of environmental health mm -hmm. that I thought had these histories of thinking what I thought of as more environmentally is that what they're, even though they're talking microbiome, metabolome, expososome, an expososome is its own separate thing that I think is based on a different model. They are still only will talk about singular variables in terms of relations. And so when we get in there in these meetings about like does how does the bisphenol A and the obesity work together, it is completely a singular variable. It, it's, not, it's not bigger than that at this point. And I... And... I'm, I'm not, I'm struggling with what to do with that. I mean, and, and I completely agree with you that I think that 
I mean, every time I go and I read someone else who's thinking really creatively about how to use epigenetics in this non-reductionist way, it's really inspiring, or the microbiome, but they're not doing that. And they're not doing that in terms of the way they're publishing articles about the effects of a phthalate and something else in relation to premature sexual maturation or obesity. They're, they're, they're not at this point. And I would, um, and then it's interesting feeling like I'm part of the person that's complicating that, but then at the same time, I'm also, um, well, no, I'll just leave it at that. It's, it's really, an entanglement. yeah, yeah, no, and all I'm doing with them is entangling, but at the same time, what's another way to say this? They're convinced that all the things they think are bad are bad. And I'm there to complicate it, but at the same time, the folks that I hang out with, all of us, who are some of us a bit more celebratory of that, I, I'm really nervous about that as well. So that would be. Um, oh, Christiana and then Charles. No, it's kind of along the line of the question of um, linearity and entanglement. Mm -hmm. Because, like, means I, I, I was really intrigued and I wanted to like, hear more. And I kept hearing you saying there is entanglement and then there is linearity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I, in fact, by following your ethnographic, your empirical material, what I felt was that entanglement and linearity are very entangled. Yeah. In the sense that even when you talk about the mm -hmm. um, peripheral, you talk about it as uh, this porosity and entanglement inside the barrio, but at the same time, you are comparing it to a gated community. Mm -hmm. So the, the community itself being very capable of creating specific and, and you know, put safe boundaries in a, in a certain way. So there is a form of linearity that is yep. existing. Yeah, yes, 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 yes. And so they are happening at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just kind of thinking along the lines of how they're happening simultaneously, and and maybe you can work with both uh, at the same time. And then I was thinking about your body, the linearity or entanglement of your body inside the barrio. Do you entangle when you are inside the barrio in a different way? Because you feel very <laughs> safe, uh, right? You keep saying it was so safe, mm -hmm. and at the same time it's being described as unsafe. And so, I was just wondering, I use, are you safer than other people? Do you feel safer? Okay, so one thing I should probably work to, yes, I, I definitely am trying to say the linearity and the entanglement are not separate things. And I think, it, now it's clear to me, that when I have the resilience to play off of, I think that becomes a little bit clearer. Mm -hmm. um, um, for a variety of reasons, because resilience is all about a kind of a linear, it's about a boundary that you don't want, you don't want these things to get inside this person that's supposed to become resilient, or they're good at keeping things out in all kinds of ways. And I'm saying that about the bodies, and I'm saying that about the neighborhood. And what I'm trying to say about Periferico is that the outsiders think it's unsafe, but inside everyone feels safe. Okay. And that's, so, sorry that that wasn't clear. It is a very, very safe place inside. I mean, you're also kind of forcing me to acknowledge that I'm in Mexico City in general. I think a much, I am safer than many people in Mexico City because I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm just not gonna be messed with. And most of my friends that are middle class and Mexican, they're not as safe as I am walking around in other places in Mexico City. But in this particular neighborhood, everyone's safer. And, and that's something that they express and know. It's the people narrating about it that can't get inside and are frustrated by their inability to um, manage and survey and, and interpolate. But there are different kinds of safety that yes. you're talking about. There is also an entanglement that it's about health. Well, that, that's not being safe. Well, so that's that the thing that the, the, you know, the trade-off is that I think people are pretty clear actually, that um, the ways that the safety is being produced is through things that um, are ambivalent in all kinds of ways. And so in the longer piece, and I don't know what I'm going to do with it yet, I have this whole take on auto defensa, which is this long, it's a thing in Latin America, but it also has a long tr tradition in the Latin America literature, where it's often about rural or indigenous communities that um, 
that create roadblocks to keep out the state or, and, and for a long time I thought about this as a form of out the defense and then you could start thinking about what's the self there and, and things like that. But the thing is, is that this is, this is different than out the defense because there's something, and I don't quite have the way to write about it yet, that's, um, that's about something that's grown. It's, I keep thinking about the difference between tactics and strategies, but it's something that they harnessed, but it's not like going and putting a roadblock in the place. They've harnessed the toxicity that hasn't been there for that long. Um, Wayne Cornelius, who's a political scientist who worked in Mexico City um, before he started doing migration stuff, greatly enough, I found this summer reading his work in Mexico City that he actually worked in this neighborhood. <coughs> um, and I figured it out because the, the shape of the neighborhood is so distinctive. Mm-hmm. And I interviewed him and found out that he didn't have this reputation. It, it wasn't, it, so these ramparts have grown, but they're not, they haven't grown through this kind of like, we're going to go and put this boundary down. There's a harnessing, but there's still this sense of the dam, you know, isn't good for our health or um, potentially either is the toxicity, but we're inhabiting that world. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that's, especially I feel as if I'm totally entangled with your families because I've heard you present yeah. a number of times. Yes, I think the soda stuff. I get, get to know them uh, a bit better. This yeah. was a really, really interesting uh, a- advance on, on the way that you're thinking these things through. And, and I think I'd be partly with uh, Christiana's question here. So if there's a, if you're creating a binary opposition with linearity that entanglement is defined precisely in terms of what you want to avoid, which also means that the primary distinguishing feature of it, Entanglement then becomes temporality. And of course, that's only one way in which you could potentially define or think through the dimensions of entanglement. And I wonder also partly if, because are you, where might this be placed within a bioethnographic sort of approach? Is this a priori? Is this a conceptual work that occurs outside of the periferico, outside of the colonia, which then helps you explain what's inside of it? which might be kind of interesting in terms of precisely the way you're, that you're thinking these through ethnographically. Are there any sort of bioethnographically emergent concepts that might emerge from within uh, the colonia that might be accessible to help you either mm-hmm. replace, qualify, rethink, reflect notions of entanglement or whatever you might want to think through? Uh, I also wonder about some of the work of people like Eduardo Menendez, who has thought about relationality and how all categories are defined relationally and how that that boundary work um, is done vis-a-vis creating these sorts of oppositions and how dynamic that is, precisely because one is defined in terms of the other. And how the forms of labor and care, say what happens in the clinic and what happens outside, are always mutually defining precisely and entirely sort of pragmatically dependent. So I wonder, are there any ethnographic ways that you could inflect entanglement or potentially mm-hmm. find something that would replace it? Mm, great question. Um, there isn't a fr- I've been looking. And there isn't a phrase <laughs> or some kind of concept. And it it's partly feels to me like it's the way that, in some ways, people will joke about the dam and like, oh, you know, we get the stink for free. But it's actually not something that's commented on except in relation to, oh, I went to Portland. And the, this is why I need to be here. And this is part of my being here-ness. Um, but... There's so much stuff that's unremarked. So for instance, her grandson, um, who is actually the, not her biological grandson, but his first year of, two, two years of life lived outside of Periferico and then <coughs> lived inside um, his third year of life and then got allergies. And his mother, who I would have lots of talks with because we were living in the same town, town would say like, oh, he got sick here. And I would keep, kept trying to elicit sort of like, so, what is it because you moved into Petty Bay? Is it the dam? Is it the fact that the house <coughs> flooded um, and that our cement walls are filled with this? And there was just, there just isn't actually that much uptake of there is something specific about this, this place that's keeping people out except the ability to, the knowingness and the way that we can keep the police out. But there isn't, 
and, and I have been struggling this. There's things like the minute anyone in Periferico ever finds out that someone eats alone, they almost start crying. Mm -hmm. But that's but that's a. I mean, and maybe I could come up with some way to talk about that that also relates to this permeability. But what struck me is that when you go to other places like Fundesa, I mean, Mexico, it's a fancy neighborhood, right? There, people are just as worried as most people I know in North America about like, oh, there's spray paint here, and they're worried about um, things getting into their children's bodies, and everyone's household for dinner has a clear glass, glass a clear pitcher of water that they're serving their children. And none of those concerns are at hand when you are here. And I had, and there isn't a way that that is being talked about so far that I have been able to get at. But I think that um, I'll keep looking, <laughs> and 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 if you have suggestions, that would be great. But I I haven't I haven't one. I guess what I'm trying to say is it's so noteworthy how the permeation that allows for this boundary that keeps certain people out is so unremarked in a certain way. It's it's like been built up in the body. We should mm -hmm. probably only take one more question because we're yeah. supposed to end this. Okay. Uh, thank you. Terrific work. I have a series of little questions. Um, one is what do they smell? Um, and also, I mean, I think you're talking about the real... Are you talking about a social body in some way also when you're talking about, you know, somebody not eating them? Um, and that they seem so... Uh, in their world that they certainly don't have, it, they don't sound like they have the concept of porosity. Um, that seems like an objective term, I don't know. Um, the other one is, how do they marry? <laughs> Who do they marry? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> okay, um, what do they smell? People talk about the smell, I mean, like I start with Signora Nanti, always joking about the smell, but people smell it less than I smell it, I think. I mean, that's, that's my, but, it's, but that's about going away and coming back. And I think different people smell it differently because most women don't have formal sector employment and don't leave throughout the day, whereas not all, a lot of men work there. There's so many workshops there. I mean, all of the, the dust and the, that's all because there's a fair amount of workshops. But the men who go away and come back are, being outside the smell mm -hmm. and then coming back into the smell every day. Although I realized after, when I would just go away for a day, I wouldn't notice it. It would be going away for a few days and coming back that it would be like, there it is. And it also kind of depends on the season of the year, um, like if it's rainy or dry. Um, and, and I have been thinking a lot about that also in relation to different physical sensations like temperature, which, so smell and temperature. Um, that's a good question. Okay, who do they marry? I'm skipping over your question about porosity because that um, people tend there's a lot of marriage inside um, I was always people were trying to marry me off to get me to stay inside and um, um, and then there's a fair amount of marriages or I mean legal or not, informal or not, with people outside in other working class neighborhoods. And then the main thing is, I mean, it's like so old fashioned anthropology, the, the pattern is natural, patrilocal residents. So, you know, they're living in um, the, the, the man's household. And if that's a family in Barrio Norte, they're moving there. So some of the women I knew were, didn't grow up in Barrio Norte. And so they're um, strangers for a while, and then come in and have a lot to say about the difference between mm -hmm. this place and where they grew up in all kinds of ways. So perhaps I should first of all, I'd like to thank Deborah what's the crew for not only arranging thank this you talk, so but much. for labor over the entire afternoon. Of the Berkeley <laughs> Center for Social Medicine, and I'd like to thank you for a wonderful talk and for a visit back home. <laughs>